everyone. Kodai's sonata was groundbreaking when he wrote it in 1915 and continues to be one of the most challenging and rewarding pieces in the cello repertoire. It is the most important work for solo cello that was written after the Bach Suites and it took uh, about 200 years for it to happen. Um, let's talk about structure to begin. The first movement is in uh, the sonata form. There is a first theme, obviously, etc. Um, a second theme that starts measure 32. The development in bar 79. And recapitulation in bar 152. But the tonal organization, I mean the keys that Kodai uses are not traditional. The second theme is not on the dominant or relative major key, and the recap is not of the first theme, as you just heard, but rather of the second theme. Um, and I will discuss these soon. What is important to understand is that this is not a fantasy movement or a mere atmospheric piece. This movement is written in the classic Sonata Allegro movement form. Um, there is always a clear direction to the writing and a rigid outline a beginning and end to sections and logic behind the writing. The tempo, though free at times, should have a clear pulse. By the way, the other two movements in this sonata are also traditional forms. The second movement is in an ABA form, and the third movement is an expansive sonata form. Mm. Let's talk about Hungarian language and pentatonic scales. Kodai uses Hungarian music within traditional or classical music forms. A defining characteristic of the Hungarian language is uh, the accent falling on the first syllable of words. Uh, similarly, we see a lot of strong uh, downbeats, uh, obviously in the beginning. <laughs> This is uh, not to say that every bar has accent on the first beat. Um, in bars five and seven, the accent is on the second beat. We can imagine that the bar line shifted and now starts on the second beat of bar five. Not only did it shift, but now each beat is worth two quarters. So if I start from bar four. So if you think of this, the second beat, as the first beat, and um, I'm going to count in a large three beats. So, one, two, one, two. Hard to speak and uh, play at the same time, but um, this is uh, not to say you should uh, completely disregard the bar lines. I think that the uh, uh, the polyrhythm here uh, comes to play and it, it gives that groove. In bar nine, we have a short uh, two quarters bar that brings us back on track so that we can count the heavy one, the heavy beat, on the downbeat of measure, um, let's see, measure 10. last chord was the downbeat of uh, measure uh, 10. In bars 84, 85, and 86, Kodai shifts the bar lines again, um, and it is the polyrhythm, again, uh, the tension between the written bar lines and the accents that makes the music groove. Um, let me start from the um, development. <laughs> think of that uh, octave E flat as uh, a downbeat uh, that shifted. 
Another characteristic of Kodai's music is the use of pentatonic scales as the basis for uh, many of the themes throughout the piece. Um, in the beginning, he uses, for example, a pentatonic B scale. Um, so we have um, a pentatonic scale um, is a five note scale, as you might know already. And so one, two, three, four, five, and one again. So bars 13 to 17, uh, we have a strong beat and vertical writing. Um, I like to take a little uh, freedom on those ascending pentatonic scales here. And again, the vertical and the pentatonic scale. Um, so uh, we alternate between a free motion, linear motion, and a more a rigid vertical uh, motion. Another example of a pentatonic scale starts in bar 125. But Kodai takes out the F sharp, so we have... But here, finally, he adds the F sharp. Semitones. Let's look at bars 13 through 20 and notice the descending minor seconds uh, followed by ascending minor seconds. Um, we start... Uh, so the G go to, goes to F sharp. Again, G going to... F sharp that jumps an octave high instead of we're going G to F sharp and then we continue again D to C sharp that that C sharp that should have been lower but jumped an octave high now we start um, the minor second starts going up uh, B, C, D sharp, E, and finally we arrive at F sharp. Um, Celeste Power, who wrote an interesting dissertation on this piece, explains that these semitones that are going up uh, signify an approaching arrival, and we can see that arrival on the F sharp, as I just played, um, in measure 20. In bars 26 and 27, I like to bring out the top note in the pizzicato arpeggios. So, um, bar 31, 32, and 33, uh, in your mind or in your gut, you should count the rests when you play the long G. So, um, I could have written a fermata if he wanted to, but this is measured. Um, after three beats of rest, the second theme is not only separated by time, but by character. The character is very different than the character of the first theme. Uh, whereas the first theme is masculine and vertical, this is singing and linear. Looking at bars 32 to 43, the theme repeats three or four times, depends on how you see it. The first time would be this. time third time this was this could be the fourth time two three one two um, in bar 39 save your bow play near the bridge and when you come to the uh, six tuplets um, and string crossings you will have to move slightly away from the bridge in order for uh, the notes not to sound ponticello or squeaky.
The motive in bar 44 is an echo of the first subject or theme, and it repeats throughout the movement. If you compare to the first subject, and then um, I prefer keeping this uh, motif in one bow every time I play it. I would encourage you to write down the slurs because this is something you want to get right. It can get complicated easily if you're not organized. Um, I'm adding a link to my score for your reference. Bar 63, the arrival is on A instead of A flat. Um, it certainly is unexpected and thus deceptive. Um, let me play um, the way it could go. <laughs> deceptive note we have again uh, the, the uh, second theme motif um, and uh, the espressivo marking in the lower um, register again try showing the alteration with the color of sound and even with your face the darker lower motif and the ethereal, otherworldly upper one. So. There is one more attempt, if you will, of a cadence. Uh, which again is deceptive, and finally Kodai resolves the tension, and we arrive at the low E flat in measure 70. This does not yet feel like a final resolution, though, uh, and indeed, after a relative quiet, the storm comes back, and measure 79 is the beginning of the development. Notice the low E flat in bar 78, and uh, try to continue the next uh, E flat with the same color. So. Bars 85 and 86, um, be aware of the written in accelerando, but don't rush. The accelerando plus the appassionato marking in bar 84 helps propel us uh, towards the peak of this mountain. Other mountains are coming. Notice that in bar 91, Kodai does the opposite. He adds a beat and so makes us slow down, a written in retardando. Um, on top of the indicated poco rit, and I'm going to start in bar 89. <laughs> Measure 132, we have G major chord, another example of a deceptive uh, cadence. There's a lot of tuning in this piece. Um, by the way, the way to tune is, is also compare the bottom uh, harmonics. And, and sometimes also this F sharp. Uh, this harmonic, which is usually sounding a little flat, so not a perfect way to tune. But. Um, okay, back to the piece. Uh, in measure 132, we have a G major chord, another example of a deceptive cadence. Um, play this. Uh, Measures 146 to 149 um, fail as the true recapitulation of the first theme because uh, they do not occur in the tonic key of B. That said, I always thought that was the recap. Um, and let me play. Uh, 
does begin at the restatement of the second theme group in measure 152, which is in the tonic key of B. In the chords in measure 146, which I just played, I bring out the top line, which is the melody. talk a little bit about fingerings, um, fingerings and trills. The, in bar 13, use the third finger on the A rather than a harmonic. In my opinion, it is uh, important uh, to vibrate on this A. Uh, I also like to connect it uh, to the following G. Let me show you two different uh, fingerings for bar 67. Um, so I cross the strings there, but you can, of course, do... Or something uh, similar to that. In bar 83, I like um, going up on the D string. Here. So that I'm ready for that octave. When uh, working on passages that require um, a fast movement, I would um, practice slowly and shift on the old bow. Um, I also do the uh, dotted rhythms to practice. And then... So we use another uh, quite boring technique where I add a note every time to the group. So I etc. So you can do the opposite stuff from the top. Which is quite a bit harder. Um, by the way, for those trill passages, one uh, turn at a time is uh, enough. For me. This is it for now. I'm going to add a link to Janos Starker's masterclass uh, on this piece. It's very informative and I uh, urge you to watch it. Thank you. Bye.